Well, just uh, a few words, because I think we all know very well Professor Jane. I think we don't have to introduce him. Um, perhaps he's the one of the top uh, scientists in this, in this area in which we all work. So I don't have to make uh, a long and uh, clarifying presentation because it is clear from the very beginning. Uh, but of course, as you know, he has, um, he is the recipient of almost, I should say, almost all the awards that in our field of, huge field of pattern recognition and uh, machine learning, computer vision, signal processing, and specifically in biometrics. He has won almost all the awards. He has been the um, editor-in-chief of many journals, specifically from 91 to 94 of the IEEE transactions on PAMI. So that's, uh, I think, um, the main, the, ma the main thing in terms of um, editing uh, uh, journals. Then he's been also he has done in the last, I say, in the last decade, all the 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 very important books on biometrics, like the Handbook of Biometrics, Handbook of uh, Fingerprint Recognition, and so on. So he has been involved also in all these. Um, very important for us uh, handbooks. Uh, he's fellow of uh, the major societies, of course, IEEE, IAPR, and, and the major societies in, in pattern recognition. And uh, uh, I think the, the, the topic of this keynote is uh, exciting. The solve, the unsolve, and the unexplore. So let's thank again Professor Jane from coming here, and we, um, and I think it's going to be an exciting. Thank you very much. You know, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Uh, good morning. It's a, it's a privilege to be invited by the peers to to give this talk. Uh, when Javier asked me to be a plenary speaker last November, uh, he asked for a title, and I sent him a sort of a title which I thought was very good and his immediate response was, well, it's too pedestrian. Why don't you come up with a title with some gusto in it? And so then here's the title. And then when I started preparing for the talk a few months back, then I realized, well, <laughs> this is not an easy topic to cover. Uh, but nevertheless, I think the main purpose of this talk is really to take a self-assessment of where our field is, how we got here, and where do we go from from here because you know we are sort of at a crossroads where a lot of easy problems in biometrics have been addressed and now we need to look at the applications and 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 learn what kind of challenges there are where we can make a contribution so what i'm going to say some of it uh, you may not agree but that's okay uh, uh, that's the that's the purpose of this talk is to essentially give my personal views on it and as the vice rector mentioned, research and innovation are important. And we cannot do research and innovation unless we know what our competition is, what is the, where is the technology. That means we must always be linking ourselves with the application domain, with the, what are the, what are the state of the art systems which are available. And as Colonel from the Guardia Civil mentioned, biometrics has a very important role in forensics. And it is sort of distressing to see at this conference that only three papers were submitted related to forensics and all three were rejected. So I think that's a fertile ground for us to, to really uh, get involved in. So, so with this title, after I you know, sort of looked at this title, then said, well, nothing is really um, solved in our field. So it's, all, it's almost solved. And I think, again, we need to be aware of what is the requirement uh, by which we measure or assess what problems are solved and what are not solved. So some of you may be wondering why I included 50 years of biometric research in the title, and the reason for that is here. The first paper on automatic fingerprint matching, automatic fingerprint matching, 
appeared by Trowering in the, in the journal Nature in 1963, which, is, which was 50 years ago, 2013. The first paper on voice recognition that I could find in terms of automatic recognition is Pattern Matching Procedure for Automatic Talker Recognition in Journal of Acoustical Society of America. That also appeared in 1963. In the case of FACE, often we, we look at Kanade's PhD thesis and, and view that as the first paper on, on face recognition, but there was a lot of work done by Woody Bledsoe, who was a very smart person, who, who did some early work on man-machine facial recognition, agreed that it was not a complete uh, automatic face recognition system. The fa facial landmarks were manually marked, but in forensic scenarios also we manually marked the land landmarks, but at least he, he emphasized what are such landmarks and, and how do you compute the, the distances between the landmarks. Hand geometry, many of, many of us don't view hand geometry as a, as a biometric in the sense that there's not much research to be done, but these were one of the early commercial systems and the pattern for that was in 1971. Iris is relatively a new biometric technology. Uh, the first patent on iris recognition system appeared in 1987, and the first algorithm, uh, which by Dogman was patented in uh, around the same time, and then the first paper by Dogman on iris matching using iris code appeared in PAMI in, in 1993. Also, it's interesting to note that 50 years ago was the beginning of the research in artificial intelligence pattern recognition and image processing. If you, if you track the literature, early 60s was when the work by Minsky and others started appearing in AI and, and pattern recognition. Also, we are working in a very exciting field of biometrics, and it is not just the impact of biometrics in the forensics community, but it is the impact of biometrics in the developing world, which is really important. So the world's population is about seven billion, and about one billion of them are already covered in the various continents in terms of the civil registry system, healthcare system, and voting system, and so on. And when the India's UID program gets at the full scale, this number would easily double in the next four to five years. So I think we also need to look at where the impact of biometrics is in other countries. China is starting a national ID program, I heard, and so that will suddenly add another billion people in due course to the total number of people covered under biometrics. So this is the outline of the talk. What is biometrics? All of us are experts in biometrics, but I think it's, 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 it's important to always keep in perspective. How did biometrics get started? Where are we now and where do we go from here? So this slide essentially shows, I call it biometrics conundrum or puzzle. Uh, there's a user, there's an application, and there's a biometric recognition system. And I think the main, main thing I want to emphasize is that the researchers in our community, we only focus on the biometric recognition. We don't keep in mind what is the application where the system will be used, and where, what is the user expecting out of the system. So we cannot really just work in terms of designing a matching system without keeping the other things in perspective. And what are the other things in perspective? Well, I mean, the system is, if user wants a service from some application, application wants to send a message to the biometric recognition system to get, get some authentication information, get some match core confidence, and this leads to some authorization for transaction authentication and, and privileges. So, so the main point I want to again emphasize is that we cannot work in biometric recognition in isolation and we need to keep the other two aspects in mind. So what is the biometric challenge? The challenge is essentially to come up with a representation, which we often call as a feature vector, and a similarity measure, such that the intra-subject similarity is very high, multiple instances of the same subject are, are viewed with high similarity, and the different subjects are viewed with very low similarity. And that's really the challenge. If we can solve this problem of representation and similarity measure, which is the fundamental problem in pattern recognition and machine learning, then we have sort of a good control over 
biometric recognition. Now, in the case of face recognition, the main challenge is given a probe image or a query image. We search a very large gallery, millions of images, and we find a match. And the reason why face recognition continues to be a challenging problem is because we don't have a good invariant representation. Whether the person has a different expression, pro profile face, illumination changes, that poses a significant challenge to face recognition. In the case of fingerprint matching and iris recognition, the representation is rather invariant, and we are able to tackle that problem in an easier way. The other thing to keep in mind is that all the biometric decisions are based on this threshold T. That is, if the similarity measure is greater than T, then it implies a successful match. And the same biometric system can be installed in different applications with different threshold. And it is acceptable. This notion of zero error rate is not that critical for successful deployment of biometric systems. So why is biometrics important, or why is it getting a lot of attention? Well, security, convenience, audit trail, fraud, and deduplication. And this deduplication is what drives large number of applications in the developing world, including the UID system in India. And this is a nice uh, 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 newspaper item I saw. Palm vein scanners are being used for patient registration in Houston hospital system. About 2,500 out of about 3 million patients registered into the system are named Maria Garcia, and 231 of them have the same birth date. And so here you see the value of biometrics as a way of uniquely identifying a, a patient when the patient comes for some service. So this is, we'll know more about the India's Aadhaar project tomorrow, to, and the main goal is to give the poor an identity about out of the 1 billion people living in India, approximately 500 million people have no form of identification, no driver license, no ID card. And this is a way to give them some credentials which they can utilize for getting opening bank accounts and giving them some privileges. So, so far, 350 million unique 12 digit ID numbers have already been issued. And this is a major, major undertaking. There is no other biometric database which comes closest to, closest to this, uh, this database. There are many other applications of biometrics, and the number of applications continue to grow. But when it comes to commercial application, there's always this notion of return on investment. Should biometric system really be used? Why, why, is, why should we deploy a biometric system? And what will be the cost of the system? And I just want to point out uh, this application in, in Chinese coal mines, which is quite interesting. Um, and, you know, Xenon Sun is here, but uh, TNU Tan is not there. Their research went into designing the system uh, to keep track of which workers were inside the mine and which have come out. And there, there have been a large number of mine accidents in coal mine accidents in China, and it is often difficult to keep track of who is inside, who is outside, and, and the eye recognition system works very well. And this also demonstrates that no biometric trait is optimal. Face would not work, fingerprint would not work for obvious reasons, but eye is more effective in this particular scenario. So I want to give some historical perspective of biometric, that it is not as new as we think. It didn't start just with the ICB conferences. It has been around for a number of years. And I think it is perhaps safe to say that the, the start of biometric system can be traced to the Habitual Criminal Act in the British Parliament, which was basically, if, if you are a multiple offender or repeat offender, then the amount of sentencing you will get or the number of years in the prison will increase. For the first time offender, the number of years in prison will be, say, only if three years. But if you, if you are a repeat criminal, then the number of years of prison sentence will increase, correspondingly increase. So they kept a, a book called Habitual Criminals Returns Book. And if your name was in that book, then you will get more severe punishment. So how do we know whether this person is a repeat criminal or not? Because most criminals use an alias. They don't always give their true name. 
And this led to the start of some method by which we can recognize a person whether he, he was arrested before or not. And this led to the, the well-known system, which is historically cited but not used for a very long time, called the Batillon system, which is the, a French police inspector who came up with a variety of measures. And these were recorded for every prisoner. And for a returned prisoner, then they were trying to manually match this system. As you can see, this is a very cumbersome system and was not very effective and did not last very long. But the important thing to note is this, to me, is the first use of soft biometrics and also the first use of multi-biometrics. Because it is using multiple human attributes, it is also using a number of soft attributes. And if you look closely here, they're still using some, some information about the, the hair color and the, and the complexion and the weight, height, whether the person has a tattoo or not, and so on. Then the, the system based on fingerprints started, and I really like this quote from Francis Galton, which appeared in Nature in 1888, perhaps the most beautiful and characteristics of all superficial marks on human body are the small furrows with the intervening ridges and their pores, which are disposed in a singularly complex yet even order on the under surfaces of the hands and feet. And so basically, it was amazing to see that just a small area of one of your fingers was sufficient to uniquely identify an individual. And so soon after this, the, the Scotland Yard adopted fingerprint as a, as a method for identification. And now all the world's forensic agencies and law enforcement agencies use fingerprint as a method for identification. So in my opinion, <clears throat> the three most popular biometric traits are the fingerprint, face, and iris. And there is a reason why I call them as the most popular biometric traits. First, first of all, every, every national government has a large legacy database of fingerprints, whether it's for criminal or civil or whatever purpose. So there's a huge legacy database. It is capable of doing one to n search, one to 50 million, one to 100 million, and that has been demonstrated in, in, in a variety of applications over the course of time. And there is a standard third party evaluation which is available for, for fingerprints. For the face, there's a large legacy database. The other important reason why FACE is going to continue to be popular is the covert capture using surveillance cameras. Fingerprint and iris are not that easy to capture using at a large distance or using a covert method. And there's also a NIST evaluation available. Iris matching, you can do one-to-end search. High accuracy, NIST evaluation. The reason I didn't put one-to-end search for for face, in a constrained environment you can do. For mugshot, you, it is possible to do. But for arbitrary pose, it is difficult still. So these are the reasons why I consider these to be the three most biometric traits. And I will talk about other biometric traits as well shortly. Now, I want to give some historical perspective on the, on the fingerprint, face, and iris, because these are the three most popular biometric traits. So the work of Fowles, Henry, Galton, and so on was instrumental in getting the fingerprint started. But even before that, there was evidence that people were aware of the pattern on their fingers. And so the ancient artifacts had, had fingerprint pattern. Of course, they didn't know that this could be used for matching. But at least they were curious that this pattern somehow is, is, is interesting. The rolled ink on paper was started by, I don't know if I can pronounce this name very correctly, Juan Vucetich, um, in, in, and Argentina saw the first use of fingerprint as forensic evidence. Scotland Yard adopted in 1901. FBI set up a fingerprint identification division in 1924. This is the towering paper on, in Nature on automatic fingerprint matching. In the 1970s, FBI initiated the de development of automatic fingerprint identification system. In 2004, after the 2001 terrorist bomb, uh, US visit program was started. In 2008, FBI started 
the next generation identification, which will include the use of palm prints, face, iris, and other biometrics. In 2009, India started the UID program, where you know every uh, the, the biometric, the ten fingerprints and two iris are used as a method for deduplication. So in the bot, so the difference between the top is sort of the both the algorithms and the and the usage, and in the bottom we see the the technology for fingerprint sensing, from, from rolled ink on paper to optical scanners, slap scanners, to the swipe sensors which are embedded in mobile devices and, and laptops. This is the Siemens ID mouse where in the, in the mouse there's a sensor uh, embedded in it. And this is the three-dimensional fingerprint sensor from TBS. And, and we will talk some more about this finger, recent developments in fingerprint sensing a little bit later. Here is the face recognition milestone, first paper by Woody Bledsoe, Canada's PhD thesis, 1991, the Turk, Turk and Pentland's eigenface, um, uh, PCA. This is the LDA from Bell Humor, that's the PAMI paper in 1997, Blantz and Wetter's morphable face model, Viola and Jones face detector, the LBP pattern from Mahon and Mati Pitekanin's group, um, then this, uh, the SRC, the sparse representation coding on which we had a tutorial yesterday, uh, and so on. And this is sort of the technology in terms of the, in terms of the camera. So it, this is the 35 millimeter still camera, Kodak digital camera, surveillance camera at the standard frame rate, first camera phone from Sharp in 2000, wearable camera. This is the Samsung Galaxy two, just released with a 1080 resolution at 30 frames per second. So the technology is continually improving in terms of acquiring better quality images at a faster rate than possibly we can handle. This is the iris recognition milestone. Um, uh, the concept of using iris patterns for human identification was proposed by uh, Frank Birch and the Flom and Safir iris pattern dogmas iris recognition patent, use of iris recognition in United Arab Emirates for, for deportee identification, um, use of iris recognition in field operation, by that we mean in Afghanistan and, 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 and Iraq. Uh, Flom and Safir patent expired, <coughs> India's UID program, and now other countries are starting. Mexico has a national ID, Indonesia has a national ID, which is utilizing the the uh, iris recognition. And here are the camera iris capture development. So I'm, I'm grateful to John Dogman for providing me the first iris camera which he built himself in 1989. This is one of the earliest commercial iris scanners from Securimetrics portable iris recognition device in the field operation. Sarnoff proposed iris on the move in 2006. Recently, A-Optics, designed an application and a, and a device to convert a smartphone to capture iris images. And this, I just saw a demo of this last week when I was in California. My former student, Salil Prabhakar, has started a company where he modified the, the mobile phone into an iris capture. And it's really, the quality of the image is really uh, impressive. So there's a continuous, continuous uh, improvement in, in capturing the iris images. And with this, having this capability to capture iris from mobile device, suddenly you now can capture four things. You can capture voice, you can capture fingerprint, iris, and the face. And so suddenly you have a multimodal system on a mobile device. What about the other biometric traits? I've sort of separated them into, into three categories. One is traits with legacy database. There's more use of palm prints in the in the forensic community because 30% of the latents found at crime scenes, at least in the United States, are those of palm prints. And traditionally, the law enforcement has not been collecting palm prints because of the large scanners which are needed and larger computational requirements. Just to give you an illustration in terms of computational requirements, a typical rolled fingerprint may have about 100 minutia, but the palm print, full palm print may have about 1,000 minutia, and most palm print matching systems typically use um, uh, minutia for matching. 
where FBI's NGI will have a latent palm print matching capability, and so most of the state police agencies in the United States are capturing palm prints now. The DNA evidence is very important, and, and, and now more and more DNA data is being collected, so the CODIS database is becoming larger and larger, and I will talk a little bit more about it later with the, with the availability soon of real-time DNA ma matching. But the main thing to emphasize is that both palm print and, and DNA can be used to conduct one-to-n search where n, n is very large. What about other traits? So again, I have classified them into two categories. One is traits and commercial systems. And these are primarily for one-to-one -one match for verification purposes. So this is the palm vein system from Fujitsu. This is the palm on the back of your hand, at the palm vein on the back of your hand, the hand geometry system. This is still used for time and attendance application in, in many uh, factories. Signature, finger vein, this is the system from Hitachi. And Morpho designed a system which could capture both finger vein as well as fingerprint. And this is the voice pattern, and I'll say a little bit more about it later. And these are the traits. I have put them into the laboratory stage. I don't want to off offend anybody if some of these uh, uh, biometric traits are actually uh, implemented in a commercial system. Gate, keyboard dynamics, this is the eye vein pattern, EKG, EEG, um, the, the finger knuckle, uh, scars, marks, and tattoos, ear, and periocular. That means a region around the eye, not just the iris uh, image itself. So there's always this notion of which biometric trait is the best. And, and, and I think the best way to answer that is that the, there are some requirements of a biometric trait depending on the application. So there's an issue of uniqueness. Is it distinctive across, across users? And this users doesn't mean the world's population, but it, it could mean the users for the intended application. So it could be for the for the University Autonoma, which has maybe 30,000 students, and is it unique to take, uh, distinguish those 30,000 individuals? Uh, permanence, does it change over time? Universality, does every user have it? And this issue of permanence is also getting a lot of attention in terms of aging. Does the biometric patterns age? Of course, human body ages, so the biometric trait will also age, but the issue is, can we come up with a age invariant template, that's the challenge. Collectability, can it be measured quantitatively? Performance, does it meet error rate throughput? User experience, vulnerability, can it be easily spoofed? Integration, can it be embedded in an application? So I think if you want to answer the question, which is the best biometric trait, you must, you must address these questions in terms of the application that you have at hand. So in that sense, no biometric trait is optimal, but there are many which are admissible depending on the, uh, of the application requirement. And you know, there are some other things. This, I saw this cartoon, some rejected biometric traits, tongue prints and karaoke singing, cat scan, and, and so on. So I think we need to keep in perspective the, the applications where biometric will be used. So where is biometrics now? So in terms of the fingerprint matching, and I'm going to summarize these results because, uh, and these results are primarily based on NIST evaluations, and the NIST evaluation reports are, are, are extremely large, so I'm simply summarizing for the, for the benefit of the audience, where is the technology? So in terms of rolled print or plane-to-plane -plane fingerprint matching, the last, this result, which is available, is 2003. They have conducted a new test in 2012, but I haven't been, the, the results are not released. Um, <clears throat> but the point is that the accuracy, true acceptance rate, is about 99.4% at 0.01% false accept rate. That is, one in 1,000 false accept, the true acceptance rate is pretty high. And as you know, NIST evaluations are usually done on on large amount of data with, uh, with operational uh, data. Latent to rolled matching, 
NIST ELFT EFS2 has 63.4 percent rank one accuracy, uh, which is which is quite good. But this is the area where we need to make some improvements. The only public domain database for latent fingerprint matching, if you are interested in working on it, is NIST SD27, and the state of the art accuracy on this database, uh, which is quite difficult. A rank one accuracy is 72 percent, which is extremely impressive. Anybody who has worked on, on latent matching, if you are aware of the difficulty of this database, the rank one accuracy is 72 percent by one of the commercial vendors. So the point is we need to keep in mind what is the state of the art in terms of the commercial matching accuracy uh, before we decide to work in, in certain field. And the other thing to keep in mind is that the matching speed. Often we don't pay attention to the matching speed. And the commercial systems can match roll print to roll print at millions of matches per second. And so, yes, sure, they use specialized hardware, but many times the specialized hardware is not necessarily a very expensive machine. It could be just a multiprocessor, which you can even afford to buy these days. What about face recognition? There have been multiple evaluations of face recognition over the year. I'm just going to talk about the FRBT 2012 and the MEDS 2. So the mugshot matching, matching um, a face image to 640,000 gallery faces. Mugshot is 96% and Visa photos is about 99%. In MEDS 2, there are a little bit more, more variations in terms of uh, expression, pose, illumination, so this is the same subject here, the same subject here. The, the best commercial accuracy is 97%. So when I say COTS ABC, COTS means commercial off the shelf system. So there is quite a bit of variations among the commercial systems. And just to be on perspective, I want to give some performance of the baseline. Eigenfaces, this is the PCA, this is the LDA, this is the LBP. So what baseline you use is also very important because if you propose a new algorithm, you can always do better than the baseline most of the time. Uh, but you know, we also need to keep in perspective what is state of the art in, in face matching. Iris recognition, again, there's a huge document in IREX3. So I just want to summarize it. There's about, uh, there are 6.1 6 million images in the database. Over 95 algorithms were evaluated. The single eye iris false negative identification rate, that is the miss rate, is at about 1.5%. And for two eyes, it goes down to 0.7%. And the number of false positives, as we know, for iris is extremely small. The pupil dilation and constriction can impact the iris recognition performance and the template size varies among different vendors from one kilobyte to 20 kilobyte. And these are some of the examples of iris images which could not be successfully uh, matched. Uh, speaker recognition, and I want to thank Joachim to correct a few things here. I'm not an expert in speaker recognition, and since at this conference we don't get many papers on talking about speaker recognition, I think it is important to to keep in mind what is the progress in, in speaker recognition. So the challenge is given a target speaker and a test speech segment is the target speaking in the test segment. And in this SRE 12 evaluation, the, there is a substantial amount of background noise. And I wish I could have played the sample segment, which I cannot hear um, uh, because the, the, the internet speed in the hotel slows down quite a bit at different times. But anyway, the point is that at an FAR of 0.01%, TA true accept rate is 80%. And this is not a isolated word to isolated word matching in a very controlled setting. The, the background noise is, is quite significant. And so there is a huge progress which has been made in, in speaker recognition. And I think we should keep that in mind as a viable biometric trait, which often we don't discuss in this community. So I also want to sort of give some perspective on from solved to unsolved problems in, in biometric recognition. And I've classified them from 
the degree of cooperation by the user, and the vertical axis is the capture condition or imaging condition. So, so these are, this, is the, this is the best scenario. Um, this is what FRGC experiment one, face recognition grand challenge, and the state of the art system have 100% true accept rate at FAR of 0.1%. This is the, the NIST uh, uh, FPBTE 2003 evaluation, 99.4% EAR to FAR of 0.01%, and this is the IREX3 FAR of 0.01%, TAR is 97.8%. Then we have the problem of the, the, the capture conditions are more challenging, so this is one of the challenging images from the MBGC, FVC 2004, and CASIA version 4 uh, uh, iris image capture. And I'm not providing the error rates for these different uh, scenarios. This is the uncooperative user, so it's not a frontal face, profile face, user distorted fingerprint image, as in FVC 2006. And Triple IIT Delhi has a database where the users drank a lot of alcohol and then provided their image. So users were given some money to drink a lot of alcohol. <laughs> and this is the sort of the more difficult problem. Uh, there's a face, or a face recognition, there's a database called labeled faces in the wild. These are essentially images, face images downloaded from the internet. NIST SD27, latent fingerprint images, and this is the UBI iris version two. And now you can compare these accuracies here with the accuracies here. And so as we move from ideal conditions to the more challenging conditions, that's where the problem space as starts becoming more interesting, uh, especially for, for, the, for the researchers. So what are the, some of the unsolved problems? The, the, I've divided them into two categories, some of the fundamental research problems of uniqueness in, and individuality, and this is particularly important from the forensics perspective where an evidence has to be presented in a court of law. And the second thing is permanence, persistence, does the biometric trait, can it be used over a period of time? And then there are application-driven problems. The unconstrained sensing environment, the surveillance in the case of face, which is of huge importance now, and the system security and user privacy, issue of template security, anti-spoofing, and this is one of the projects, Tabula Rasa, which will be discussed in detail uh, at this conference. So the issue of uniqueness, a simple way to, to illustrate this is that if we have a 10-digit PIN number, the number of unique identities that can be resolved is 10 billion. So there's nothing magic about that. I mean, that's, uh, the, uh, the point is the reason we don't want to rely on, on PIN number is because people generally don't use an arbitrary random 10-digit number as a PIN, and it's easy to to share the PIN numbers or, or lose your PIN number and, and so on. So the question is, what can we say about a biometric trait? If somebody asked us the question, okay, we want to use iris recognition for, for identification of a large number of population, can you guarantee that uh, iris recognition will, will distinguish one million users, five million users, and so on? And I'm afraid to say that it's not easy for us to say that because any answer we give will depend on the image capture conditions and, and, and your matching algorithm. So that's the challenge which we face. The next question is, okay, suppose you're allowed to use multiple biometric traits. What, would, what can we say about identifying seven billion individuals which, are, which is the current population of the Earth? So I think we have, to be, we have to be addressing this issue of biometric trait versus the sensed image. So often we only talk about the biometric trait without paying attention to the, to the sensed image. So no matter which biometric trait you are talking about, its performance is determined by how you are sensing uh, uh, the trait. So here is the, 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 the uh, this is thanks to Zinan Sun, this is the data base of identical twins collected at Cassia. This is the, this is, they collected multi-biometrics, the face image, fingerprint image, and the iris image. And we know that fingerprint image and iris image of identical twins are different, and that, 
that can be experimentally validated as well. But the face recognition is, 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 is a problematic for identical twins, and that's why there's some interest in looking at scar marks and tattoos for separating identical twins. And the number of monozygotic or identical twin births is about three in every 1,000 births worldwide. And that number keeps, seems to be increasing because of the use of the fertility drugs. What about the persistence? What, what do we mean by persistence? That is, can the biometric trait be used over a long period of time? Well, in the case of fingerprint, we have shown that, or at least there's a, anecdotal evidence that fingerprint evidence can be used over a pe long period of time. But what about the human face or iris? Well, in the case of iris, we don't have data over a long period of time. But in the case of face, there is a database. So we have a database from, from one of the counties, Pinellas County Sheriff's Office in Florida, where the same person has been arrested multiple times. So this woman was first arrested in January 1995, then later in 1998, 1999, and last one is 2005. And this is how the facial appearance looks. So the, if I put this in the database or call it the gallery seed and use these remaining four images as the, as the query or the probe image, then these are the matching scores from two different commercial state-of-the-art systems. So there's no problem in distinguishing these two images, but the, once we start having these as the probe images, in this case for a gap of four years, the matching accuracy drops significantly. So in this particular case, the body trait, the sensed image, is, is not because just of the natural body aging, it could also be because of, the, of how the person is living, the use of the drugs, use of uh, weight loss, eating habits, whatever else. And so we need to keep that in perspective as well. So the question is, can we come up with some age invariant template? And so when we talk about aging, this is the question uh, which we should be addressing. So now the, the, the topic of uh, surveillance is quite important. There are cameras everywhere. Uh, United Kingdom and, and, and City of London has one of the largest uh, concentration of surveillance cameras or CCTV cameras. The, in Beijing, for example, the number of surveillance camera has increased outside every school, public building, and, uh, and, and, and uh, metro station, for, for example. Um, and how do we use these images acquired by these surveillance cameras? Well, right now, the way they are used is only after an incident has taken place. There is no real-time matching capability. And this became, the use of surveillance cameras becomes evident, and this is in the case of the Boston Marathon bombing, where, um, you know, the, the suspects were detected after somebody manually observed the surveillance tapes and looked at the, this tandem of two brothers who were walking uh, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the video. And so what we did was the FBI released some face images of these suspects. Um, and so these are the two probe images which were extracted from the video frame of the older brother, and these are the three images released of the younger brother. And we wanted to see whether state-of-the-art face matchers would be able to match these two uh, uh, brothers' images from a large uh, gallery database. The FBI also released these three images of the older brother, and these three images also became available of the younger brother. Now, these are not all police records. Only this one is the mugshot when the older brother was arrested. Others are from social media websites and, and other places. And so we added these six images to one million mugshots and saw what is the capability of the, of the system. Well, the older brother could not be successfully matched. These are the rank scores. So the best rank hit we got is to score at a rank of 12,000 using this as the, as the gallery image. But the younger brother could be matched at rank one uh, using this high school graduation uh, photograph of the, of the younger brother. So the point is that this 
that the, the, the state of the art commercial systems are improving, but there is a huge amount of work which needs to be done in face recognition in unconstrained environments. And this is the space which is really open for us researchers to, to make some contributions. The next thing I want to, uh, challenging thing I want to talk about is the system vulnerabilities. So every software system has some, some holes in it, security holes. No matter how secure a system we design, there are always going to be some holes because the crooks are getting smarter as well. The, it is also important to note that a majority of the attacks are insider attacks. But let's for the time being assume that we discount the insider attacks. The, the two additional vulnerabilities which biometric system introduces. One is the attack on the sensor, and the second thing is attack on the template database, which we, biometric template, which we store in the, in the system. So a typical biometric system has this as an architecture. There's a sensor captures the data. There's a feature extraction, enrollment. The templates are stored in the database, and then there is a verification uh, using a matcher. So these are the insider attacks, enrollment fraud, collusion, coercion, exception abuse. So what is an enrollment fraud? Well, you come to enroll, but then we, we substitute your biometric data with your friend's data. So the enrollment officer can always make a uh, collusion. In fact, it could be either on purpose or it could be by mistake. In fact, many, many forensic databases have certain, um, certain types of errors, especially when it comes to demographic data. You cannot always trust the demographic data in the law enforcement database. Then there are external adversary attacks, spoofing and obfuscation attacks, Trojan horse attack. I mean, Trojan horse attack is a common attack on any software system. It's not particularly uh, specialized for, for biometrics. There's a hill climbing, replay, man in the middle attacks. Again, matcher can be attacked, Trojan horse attacks. So attacking a matcher means that no matter who puts the finger or, bio, or face at the ATM machine, the, the bank, bank machine will always spit out some money. So that's an insider attack. You don't like the bank, and you can introduce an attack like that. And then there's a template attack. So there are two specific attacks related to biometric, the, the template attack and the spoofing attacks. So here are some examples of the, of the uh, spoofing attack, altered fingerprints, fake iris. Uh, can we reconstruct the fingerprint from the minutia? So the, the biometric template protection the, the challenge is that from the stored template, we should not be able to recover the original uh, sensed data. So that means it should be non-invertible. It will enhance the system security by, pre pre by preventing intrusion attacks. And the other, other thing which we can learn from this is that the, the template should not be linkable. So if you, have, if you are enrolled in multiple databases using fingerprint, we should not be able to use the template from one application and use that to attack a separate uh, uh, application. So can we generate a non-invertible and non-linkable biometric template without compromising the matching accuracy? I think that's the challenge. We can always come up with some scheme for template security, but in the current scheme of things or in the current solutions, they always lead to some degradation in the matching accuracy, which is not always acceptable. So this is sort of the holy grail for the, for the biometrics. Given a human body, can we automatically generate a key uh, from this? This cartoon was made by, uh, by my friend, Professor Typhoon Agbul at Istanbul Technical University. His, his cartoons often appear in signal processing uh, magazines. So basically, you have a human body, and you get a, a key which is unique to that particular individual. If we can achieve that, that will be really, really nice. Mark Nixon works in Gate, and yesterday I was joking with him about circumvention. Have you seen this cartoon, Mark? OK. <laughs> so this is the Gate recognition. Um, in about 10 years ago, United States governments sort of started a program called TIA, Total Information Assurance. And that evoked so much controversy in terms of the privacy that um, 
that this program was immediately abolished. But this is essentially, this cartoon was made in response to that, that you know, if you start implementing the gait recognition, people will start wearing funny clothes and funny uh, shoes, so, so, so gait, gait will not be very useful. I have a new postdoc, uh, Wendy, and he made, and he and his wife made this video for the anti-spoofing just to show that, you know, the, the, it is now indeed possible, and that's the goal of the tabula rasa, to detect the liveness, uh, whether the liveness is in terms of a photocopy image of the person's face or a replay video attack. But the challenge again is that this detection must be done in real time. So one of the applications for face and to spoofing is the mobile phone because the usage of uh, face recognition for mobile phone is, is growing. And without having the anti-spoofing capability, it, uh, it will really cause a lot of problems. And, but these, these detection algorithms must, be, must operate in real time. So in the remaining five minutes or so, I will just sort of give you my perspective, where is biometrics going? I mean, we, I think we need to keep in perspective how the progress in processor memory and sensors is proceeding because what we do in biometrics, both in terms of uh, capture, data capture, as well as the algorithms depends on this thing. Ubiquitous biometrics, and this raises the issue of context and privacy. If, if, let's say, the local McDonald's starts using biometrics for payments, I mean, do we need to have the same level of threshold as if you are entering the Guardia Civil Building, as an example? So this is, the, this is what I mean by context. Biometrics for societal good, and a lot of the applications we have talked about, India's UID and the voting uh, issues, those are all essentially biometrics for societal good. Personalization, can biometrics know who the user is so that the services can be personalized, and then biometrics and forensics, and uh, Christoph Champot will give uh, a more detailed coverage of it tomorrow, but I just wanted to mention it. So I think it is uh, my former student Karthik prepared the slide in terms of processor memory and sensing, and it's, it's, it's interesting to see that there is a 10 to the power six increase in the processor performance as you measure in terms of MIPS, millions of instructions per second over the last 20 years. I mean, that's just amazing progress which we have made in terms of processing capability. And at the same time, the, the cost per MIPS has gone down at the same rate. And here is the capacity for the memory, RAM, random access memory capacity versus cost. And this trend will continue. I mean, so that means we can have more and more powerful algorithms which we can implement on, on you know, commodity uh, processors. But I think this is interesting to see how the progress in technology sensing is taking place. So this is the traditional ink on paper for fingerprint capture in 1990s. When I first started working in fingerprint matching, we had this um, identity-made uh, optical sensor, uh, which, which was like a brick in size. Uh, this is the capacitive sensor, came out in 1990s. First swipe sensor, US visit led to this slap sensor, and now in 2010, Safran Morpho introduced this fingerprint on the fly, where you, you simply wave your, your four fingers on the sensing device, and it captures the the, the fingerprint. So this is the touchless swipe sensor. What we mean by ubiquitous biometrics, I was talking to my friend Rob Rowe, who's at Lumitime, where, where they make the multispectral sensor, and he gave a nice uh, definition of ubiquitous biometrics. Biometrics will become more holistic, where location, behavior, and recent interaction history fuse with multi, multimodal biometric ID. So that means we, don't, we shouldn't just rely on the biometric data which we capture, namely face, finger, and iris. We should also start utilizing what the user has been doing. And this has been around how do people interact with the, with the web, web search, which websites they are vis visiting, and, and so on. And <clears throat> so this, I think, uh, this cartoon is quite illustrative of the, of the ubiquitous uh, biometric. Um, I don't know if some of you, has anybody seen this cartoon? 
Okay, so you know, this is the, you know, woman sitting at a bar and then somebody comes along and uh, says, can I buy you a drink? And uh, the woman takes out her mobile phone, takes a picture, 3D optical scan in progress, initiating face recognition, querying a central database, identity match found, user rating half star, on a <laughs> zero to five star rating, user comments emotionally inaccessible, and so on. Uh, so, you know, this technology is not too far away. It's actually available. In fact, when Apple introduced its iPhone, it had the face matching capability in it, and it disabled because of the privacy uh, concerns. So, uh, two weeks ago, I was visiting uh, NEC labs in, 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 in the Bay Area, and uh, as you know, Google Glasses have become available, but only they released only 2,000 Google Glasses for, for the developers. And, and the NEC guy happened to have one, which I tried it. And what really impressed me is the quality of the images which it captures. And this, I'm just showing you the quality of the images and the video which you can capture from Google Glasses. And that raises sort of a new level of uh, capability for face recognition, which is both good and bad. And the reason it is bad is because cafes ban Google Glasses to protect customers' privacy. Fierce, fierce users of futuristic eyewear can record without permission. And this has been a topic of discussion in the US Congress as well. Uh, how do we protect users' privacy? And what does that mean? It means who owns the biomet your biometric data, what will it be used for, uh, and so on. The, the notion of this ubiquitous biometric, again, I must thank Karthik for helping me make this, is that we not only depend, we should not only depend on biometric traits which you capture, but what web services you go, your browsing history, bookmarks, preferences, online interaction patterns, e-transactions, your friends and family, so basically what you do and then the second thing is where you are. So this is where the context becomes very important. You know, for example, mobile phones has a GPS, so right away if you're doing any transaction using mobile phone, we know where you are, where you are home or office environment. And then what you are, this is where the, what we work in traditionally, the biometric traits. And the idea is that combining all this, we, can, we are able to make a better decision even if some of the data is, is rather noisy. And there's a very nice uh, paper study appeared called GPS fingerprint identification without biometric data. Just keeping track of your mobile phone history. And these researchers were able to, to detect or to identify who you are. If you're making regular phone calls at regular intervals to specific numbers, uh, even without knowing your ID. So, so these researchers worked with a, with a mobile phone company who provided them with the anonymized data. So basically you had all the cell towers which, you, which that mobile phone accessed at different times of the day and different times of the week, and they're able to tell who you are. Then there's a, this interesting thing called effective biometrics. I mean, biometrics shouldn't, this is also related to context. It should not only tell who you are, but what are your emotions and inner feelings. And maybe that can change that, you can change the threshold settings of a biometric system based on that. So this is, uh, again, I use, my friend Typhoon made this, uh, this cartoon. Now, finally, I want to talk a little bit about the use of cell phone for medical <clears throat> in, the, in the developing world for uh, health services. So, as you know, there's this organization called Gates Foundation, which spends about $5 billion or more every year on vaccination, vaccination immunization in the developing world. And so he made this nice uh, quote about most of us think of cell phones primarily as a convenient tool to stay in touch with people and store information. But increasingly, we are using uh, ways to use cell phones to deliver critical health care. And, and one of the, tomorrow I'm sure you will hear about the UID project, one of the usage of uh, using, having biometric or having this unique ID is to be, is to enable 
underprivileged citizens to, to access services through mobile phones. So I want to show you this, the mobile phone-based vaccination registry. Um, as you know, certain, vaccination, certain vaccinations like polio and so on have to be, have to be repeated over, over a period of time. And how do we keep track of which child has received all the proper booster shots? And most of the villagers in, in Africa and other have no form of identification. In fact, many cases they have only one name. Large number of people have only one name. So it is not easy to distinguish between them. And so the idea is, can we use in this particular case um, a mobile phone to capture fingerprints of newborns and infants? And so we are working with, uh, with a with a nonprofit organization, VaxTrack, who does the immunization in, in, in Benin, and to see whether it is feasible to, to do this. I think I don't want to spend time on, 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 on forensic, but I just want, I found this nice quote from the, uh, there's somebody called Locard, who's, con who's considered as the pioneer or the founder of the field of, of forensics that the perpetrator of a crime will bring something into the crime scenes and leave with something from it. And both can be used as forensic evidence. And I think that the only reason I wanted to show this is that there is a huge number of opportunities in forensics for, for biometric researchers or algorithms to be designed for efficient matching and, and more accurate uh, matching. And this can range from the clothes, the glass he breaks, the tool mark he leaves, the paint he scratches, blood or semen he deposits, and so on. And finally, just to give you some in information about DNA, is that there is a future for biometrics and DNA. Until recently, whenever we showed DNA traits, we excluded, whenever we showed biometric traits, we excluded DNA, because we said, well, it cannot be done in real time. And I think that in the next few years, Hopefully, we will have a capability where you take the buccal swab of a person, put it in the machine in a black box, and out comes the result uh, in real time, maybe a minute. Uh, right now, that is less than two hours rapid DNA. And, and the advantage of that is that with this, we can move into a new area called touch DNA, where the where the fingerprint you capture also contains the, the DNA information. Both may be noisy, the latent fingerprint is noisy, the DNA may not be complete, but together uh, they can lead to a better identification. So to summarize, I mean, biometric recognition is here to stay, so I think in that sense, we will always have uh, opportunities to continue working in it. We, there's a distinction between research and technology. The drivers for academic research is, is primarily error rates. We are always happy when we can reduce the error rate, but I think we also need to, need to be aware of what is the baseline which we are using. And the drivers for technology providers, which I think we must always keep in perspective, is the re requirements of the system for a particular application, error rates, template size, processor, throughput, and so on. So in, in one sense, one of the largest biometric systems deployed in terms of how many people use every day is the Disney World access control system, which uses fingerprint. And for them, the error rate is not as important as the, as the throughput and the, and the user uh, experience and, and so on. So I think that's, those, those issues are also extremely important. And finally, I just thought I will put some my observations on the, on, the, on the biometric. So biometric system, almost always embedded in an application. Biometric trade, there's no optimal trade, but some are better than the others. Matcher accuracy, zero error is neither required nor guaranteed. So even if you do have some error rates of zero in your experimental setting, that doesn't guarantee that on a large case operational scenario that will always be met. System evaluation, error rates in lab tests are almost always lower than the field test. Baseline, improper baseline provides false sense of progress. Security, biometrics is an effective tool only if implemented well. Biometric template, feature extraction is not a one-way function. Fusion, biometric fusion does not guarantee better performance and security. Match score, Gaussian density is not advisable, tails are critical. 
an impact? Are we making an impact, not without a perspective on application uh, and technology? And I just want to acknowledge my current students, current postdocs, former students, former postdocs who helped me put together this, uh, this presentation. Uh, so thank you very much. I know I've taken a little bit longer time, but uh, thank you very much for your attention. Unfortunately, we are running out of time because of the uh, duration of the opening session. So let's resume this time and do a short coffee break during 15 minutes and be back at 10.30 to go on with sessions. We will have time anyway during the panel and during the post presentations to, to address some questions to Professor Jane. Thank you. Thank you.